Let's now move to the process of object detection. In this unit, we'll start with the most simple, the most basic form of object detectors, which are classic sliding window object detection methods before moving to deep learning based methods in unit four. Sliding window object detection works as follows. We run a sliding window of fixed size indicated in green here over the image as such and extract features for each of these windows or crops. And then we classify each window um, using a binary classification objective, object versus background, for example, pedestrian versus anything else, using a standard classification model based on these features that we have extracted from that window. So we could use, for example, a support vector machine, a random forest, a boosting base technique, or a deep neural network for this problem. <clears throat> In order to recover objects of varying size or distances, because we have a perspective camera here, if a pedestrian appears at a near distance, it's bigger than if it's appearing at a, a larger distance further away. We also have to search across diff uh, for different aspect ratios and scales of this box. So it's becoming a, a, a pretty um, exhaustive search problem that we have to do here. And we have to search with stride in order to actually um, finish this task in feasible time. So what we did here now is to effectively convert the object detection problem into a classification problem that we know how to solve using machine learning techniques for classification. The final step is to apply non-maximum suppression or clustering to retain only one prediction per object. The problem is that if we now slide this window through all possible locations, there will be some windows in the vicinity of the actual target object here in red that will also respond highly um, in terms of the classification score output by, let's say, the support vector machine. Because they are close to the pedestrian, so they are nearly correct. But of course, we don't want to retain all of these detections. We want to keep only those, um, the best ones, and only one for each of the objects in the scene. And this is what non-maximum suppression does. It's a clustering heuristic that looks at the overlap of bounding boxes and keeps only, if there's over, uh, a large overlap of bounding boxes, then it keeps only the one that has the highest confidence. Um, so it retains only one prediction per object from the object detection algorithm. The next question we have to answer now, of course, is which feature space should we use? On which feature space should the support vector machine classify these little crops? The simplest we can do is, of course, use the RGB pixel space. But as we've already seen in the introduction unit, this would be neither viewpoint nor illumination invariant. And so it is not a good choice. A better choice would be to use a so-called histogram of oriented gradients, or in short, HOC, which was the de facto standard for more than 10 years of research in object detection. It was popularized by this paper here from Dalal at Trix called Histograms of Oriented Gradients for Human Detection. The idea here is to represent patches with histograms um, which are uh, representing gradient angles weighted by the gradient magnitude. Let's illustrate this with a simple example of this digit eight from the MNIST dataset. What we do here now for this particular crop is we first compute, we differentiate this image here spatially in X and Y direction. And then we compute the gradient magnitude and the gradient angle. The gradient magnitude is shown here at the top. The gradient angle is shown at the bottom where we have binned that gradient angle into eight different orientations. So it's a pretty coarse binning of the orientation. For example, you can see that here on the left side of the eight, we have 
um, gradients that, that are facing leftwards. And on the right side, we have gradients facing rightwards, which are blue compared to these ones, which are red. And so there's eight different colors here. Now the next step, what we do is we subdivide that image into cells. Cells are regions, subregions of the image of a certain pixel width and height. For example, in this case here, yeah, eight by eight or six by six pixels. And after that, for each of these cells, we multiply the, well, we compute a histogram where we sum up the weights for each of the angles um, that are contributing to this histogram. So for example, for this cell here, we have um, contributions from pixels that are oriented in this orange and yellowish direction, but we are not accumulating evidence for the green pixels here because they are receiving a weight of zero as they have a zero gradient magnitude here in this homogeneous region. If we look at another cell here, the second cell, we see that there's contributions from these orange and yellow pixels here. But there's also now contributions from these blue pixels here. And so we do this now for all of the cells that we have defined. The advantage of this compared to using the RGB pixel space directly so, so what we do now is, of course, we take these histograms and we use them as features, which means that we concatenate all of these histograms. And these are, this is the feature vector. So we have a feature vector where the first dimension is, um, well, the magnitude of the, the first cell of this histogram, and the second dimension is the magnitude of the second cell, and so on. And then the, in this case, the ninth um, element of the feature vector would be the magnitude of this histogram cell and so on, histogram bin. Now, what is the advantage of this histogram vector compared to the original RGB pixel space compared to just stacking all the pixels, the raw pixel information into a single feature vector? The advantage is that compared to the RGB raw pixel space, this histogram of oriented gradient features is invariant to small deformations like we can translate the uh, image a little bit and we can scale and rotate it a little bit and we can also apply little perspective deformations and it will not adjust, it will not alter the gradients too much because they are summary statistics of an entire region and also because the gradient angles have been binned into this very coarse discretized bin, binning representation. And another advantage is also that it is becoming independent of the brightness, the absolute brightness, um, as um, we, are we are computing these histograms based only on the gradients and not on the original intensity information. So these are the two aspects that led to the success of histogram of oriented gradients. They are capture relevant information. They are capturing the orientation of edges, but they are a little bit flexible in terms of translation scale and rotation and they are invariant to brightness changes for example if you change the gain or the shutter of your camera an extension of this idea of histogram of oriented gradients that became popular in 2010 is the so-called part-based model from Felsenschwalb and Gershik et al where the idea is um, to model an object based on its parts and then model the distribution of part configurations. And this idea actually goes back to, um, many, many years to the 1970s, where this has already been used. This is an illustration from one of the seminal papers in the early days. But here this is used in combination with a graphical model and this histogram of oriented features, um, this histogram of oriented gradient features for each of these parts. Now using a part-based model allows for even more invariance because we can allow for some non-rigid deformations um, of the object by simply um, adjusting the relationship of the different parts and modeling this in terms of the configuration space, in terms of the graphical model distribution. However, um, 
these models lead to slower inference because we need to solve this. We need to solve inference in a graphical model at at inference time. And it was found also that they don't lead to a huge gain with respect to well-trained multi-view Hawk models compared to simply training a Hawk model for the entire object, um, but do that separately for each different view of the object that we might perceive. However, for at least for cars, which are objects that are relatively easy to detect, these algorithms already led to impressive performance. This is really non-deep learning based inference based on these graphical models with simple histogram of oriented gradient features. And so here are some results on the Kitty data set. And you can see that it is not super precise, but it, it detects quite, quite some of these objects here.